I am uh, very pleased to be here, this great city of Hyderabad, and uh, talk to you on a subject which is of great importance to build our self-confidence for the future. We must realize, as uh, broadly Hanuman Chaudhary ji indicated, that we were the most developed country for centuries. Of course, uh, he quoted Angus Madison, but there's uh, much greater literature which has been recording this fact from a long time. The Chinese Buddhists came to India almost 2,000 years ago. And uh, they came here to collect Sanskrit documents on Buddhism. But they wrote about their stay in India. And it was, once you read it, it becomes extremely difficult to wonder why we are in the position we are today. And by knowing our past, we can get confidence we can do it again. India was the most developed country till about the 18th century. And then there was a, there was a decline from 1190, 1192, when Mohammad Ghori was crowned the Bacha in Delhi. And that decline uh, was sharply accelerated during the British period. And then our ideological mistakes after independence till the government of uh, both Mr. Chandrasekhar, which was short-lived, and, and the full-term Prime Minister Narsimha Rao, we were, by wrong policies, growing very slowly and not being in a position to recover. I would say that, uh, if, if, of course, if you want details on it, my recent book uh, titled Reset has been published. It's now gone on in a very short period of six months. It's now in the sixth edition. I've covered all these uh, periods from the British and till the present. And today I can say that if India wanted, India determined, we can become a developed country in the next 10 years. The, one of the targets set by the Prime Minister is that we should be by 2024 a, a five trillion economy, dollar five trillion economy. So the, one of the officials of the government asked me in a gathering, we had a social gathering, and he met me and he asked me, is it possible that in five years we can go from two point, that time it was just at re-elected, so we were 2.5, now 2.7 trillion dollars. So he said, is it possible that in five years we can reach five trillion dollars? I said, yes, it is possible even today. Why five years from now? It can be done today. So he said, how? I said, uh, devalue the dollar from 70 rupees per dollar to 35 rupees per dollar. <laughs> so he was taken aback and then he realized that mentioning it in dollar terms is meaningless. It's okay for the international comparisons and so on. But let me tell you that if you were to take products produced in India and looked at the price you have to pay for that product and take the same quality products in the United States and see the dollar price you have to pay for that, you get a totally different picture from 70 dollars, 70 rupees to a dollar. Take haircuts, for example. In this hotel, I'm sure that the haircuts are world class, but the price you pay here, compared to the dollar price you pay in a similar 
star uh, hotel in the United States, you'd be surprised. It is only seven, if you were to take the ratio, it is seven rupees to a dollar. If you, you have McDonald's in our country, they give uh, all those uh, 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 hamburgers and so on. You go to America in the McDonald's, you'll find the same hamburger. Or you go to pizza, same pizza. And you'll find that the ratio of the price you pay here, divided by the ratio, uh, uh, divided by the price you pay in America, makes it only three dollars, uh, three rupees a dollar. So why is it seventy dollars, uh, seventy rupees per dollar? That is because it has nothing to do with production. That determination is based on, on your demand and supply for foreign exchange, which is a very small part of the economy. So I would like to start by saying that many of the numbers you see are meaningless. And if you were to say that today and in 2024, the exchange rate between the dollar and India will remain the same at 70 uh, rupees to a dollar, then uh, at the price prevailing today, Assuming that is also the price prevailing in 2024, the growth rate required to go from 2.5 to 5 trillion dollars is 14.4 percent per year. To go from today 2.7 to um, 5 trillion dollars in 2024 is now 18.9 per year. That is unachievable. So therefore, I would say, I would not measure our prosperity in terms of well, how many trillion dollars is uh, uh, that we should have or will be able to get. I would say that, in my opinion, the government is paying too high a price for a dollar instead of seventy dollars. It today itself should be thirty-five and ultimately brought back to the level it was prevailing in 1977, which is seven rupees to a dollar. And if it is seven rupees per dollar, we will overtake China without doing any work. <laughs> so therefore, th these, this, uh, this whole arithmetic of it is, in, is a scientific study based on the estimation of GDP and so on. We were the most developed country till 17, 18th century. Then the British brought us even down faster. Why? Because the British prevented us. Those people who came as invaders before the Britishers in our country looted our treasury. Some of them stayed here and continued to loot. But those, those who came after as Britishers, they looted our currency, looted our property, and took it out abroad. And I have calculated that during the British period, the total amount of loot from India to Britain is $71 trillion. We are talking about $5 trillion. The British have taken away $71 trillion. Kohinoor, for example, adorns the queen's uh, crown. But you know where Kohinoor originally came from? It came from Andhra Pradesh, in I think uh, near Warangal. Guntur, yes, correct. Guntur. And I don't know why you are not protesting and uh, saying to the British, <laughs> give it back, give it to Andhra. You are fighting for all kinds of other things, <laughs> but not this which will transform your treasury one to, to uh, uh, Kohinoor. So there was nothing that we didn't produce. And the world was not producing much at that time. When I was teaching at Harvard, I used to live in a town called uh, Belmont, which is just next to where Harvard is, which is in the city of Cambridge, which is across the river from the city of Boston. 
And there's a huge lake there in Belmont. And it's called Fresh Pond. And the municipality had put a road on the circumference of the lake. So morning walk was really pleasant to go around it. So in one of my morning walks, I saw a signboard. It says, here stood, the, here stood, uh, it was uh, the name of the company, uh, I forget now. Here stood this company, which used to export ice to India. 1636. I was amazed. And so, therefore, I decided to go to Google and look at whether this is there, it is in the search engine. I found that the name of the company was there. And it said, indeed, that its exports to India from the state of Massachusetts was ice. And they explained why. They said that from that area, Massachusetts, of which the, uh, one of the premier cities is Boston, ships used to come to India to Kanchipuram and buy cloth, spices, so many other goods, and go back. So the king of Kanchipuram called them. There was a Chola king. He called these people one day and said, how are you doing? Everything fine with you? They said, yes, everything is very nice. People are treating us very well. But we have one complaint. He said, what's the complaint? Our ships have to come empty to India and buy from you and go back. Can you not buy something from us? So the king said, everything is produced in India. Okay, what can I buy from you? So they said, no, no, something can be thought of. So the king thought and then he said, I have never seen ice in my life. It's there in the Himalayas, but it's so far away. But in your country, I hear in the winter, the ice falls from the sky. He meant snowfall, but he said ice. So will you bring ice? I will buy ice. Because uh, I want to see what ice is like. So in the winter, that lake used to freeze. And they used to put sawdust on it and cut up the uh, lake, put it in their ship and take it all the way to Kanchipuram. The first export from the United States was ice from Massachusetts to India. And see what a change today it is. We can recover all this. But we must know why we after independence did not grow fast enough till 1990. It is because Jawaharlal Nehru <laughs> Jawaharlal Nehru insisted on adopting the Soviet economic model. And what is the Soviet economic model? extract resources from agriculture and finance industrial development and that too heavy industrial development steel plants this that it was all right for soviet union up to a point because before communism came to the soviet union the czars had brought about an agricultural revolution in soviet union so agriculture had plenty of money and so Lenin and most, mostly after that Stalin was able to extract those resources and build all these industrial plants. But India was actually sucked dry. The British uh, saw to it that agriculture had no resources. Why? Because in 1857, Britishers found to their horrible surprise that one lady called uh, Johnny Jansi. She led an army against the British. In Karnataka also there was a lady called Rani Chennamma. There are ladies all over, but uh, our history books have forgotten that. And uh, today also ladies in Indian politics are very fierce. Mamta Banerjee, <laughs> Mayavati, Jaya Lalita. I'm talking only of Indian ladies, not Italian ladies. <laughs> So 
so they were shocked due to a foolishness of one of them who declared the, who triggered the war out of schedule rani jansi could not win but after the defeat the british established uh, their direct empire in india with queen victoria as the uh, as the queen of india and said never again such a revolt should take place why because rani jansi was financed by the farmers of india they gave her money they gave her recruitment uh, people for recruitment and so to destroy the backbone of the indian farming community they introduced a new system called the zamindari system with this variation here and there and the zamindari system was entirely of only one job and that is to collect revenue for the british but the british said to these zamindars you can collect as much as you want but you have to give this fixed amount every year for the british administration in india so they recruited criminals and these criminals then went about sucking the agriculture dry they had the power that if the farmer could not pay then they could take away the jewels of his wife if the jewels of the wife had also gone then they can take over the land of his brother and there was no law except the zamindari law and therefore by 1947 agriculture had become completely bone dry there was nothing poverty and poverty and nothing else and jawaharlal nehru he decided that uh, we'll have soviet model now country soviet model has not even worked in, in in the soviet union they used to all these communists i don't know whether there any communists left in hyderabad now they all over the country they are dropping in numbers now there is only 1% of the vote or something like that uh, yes <laughs> so these communists used to tell me <clears throat> that in soviet union there is no unemployment there is no inflation there is no poverty soviet union is heaven well in 1991 i told one of these communist leaders ems namudripat now there is no soviet union also <laughs> they broke into 16 pieces one of them is kazakhstan <laughs> there is no soviet union and that soviet model has been completely discredited So in 1990, I came into office. I became the senior most minister, Mr. Chandrasekhar, with two portfolios, and uh, we decided that we cannot make progress unless we reform. I prepared the blueprints, but Mr. Chandrasekhar government didn't last very long, and there were elections, and Nasima Rao, the great. Uh, what son of varangal no he is varangal that that's why i thought koinur is also from varangal because narsimha rao is also from varangal <laughs> <laughs> narsimha rao asked me to join his government but he made a condition you have to join congress party he said i said yeah, i will not join congress party he said why I said because Congress Party is owned by the Nehru family, and you are just a tenant. <laughs> Tomorrow they'll kick you out. Then what will happen? I I cannot take that chance, so I will not join. So he gave me a minister rank position with the charge of the WTO negotiations, which are taking place at that time, <clears throat> the new GATT agreement. So Narsimha Rao. was the one who implemented the economic reform program the blueprints were pre uh, prepared by me the implementation was done by the finance ministry minister mr uh, manmohan singh <coughs> and narsimha rao gave him the support because in my presence manmohan singh used to cry 
saying, oh, I'm being abused every day in, pa in parliament, I'm an American agent, I'm this, I'm that, and that I'm giving up socialism. He says, blame it on me. He said, I'm responsible. With that kind of support, Manmohan Singh was able to implement. But the media and all gave credit to Manmohan Singh. Nobody gave credit to Narasimha Rao. If Manmohan Singh was so good, then in 10 years, why didn't he produce any economic reform? As Prime Minister, I've been telling Narendra Modi, if there's anybody who deserves Bharat Ratna, it is Narasimha Rao and nobody else. And I will not rest till that happens. I don't know what is the delay. Between 19, 1947 and 1990, when the Soviet model was there, our growth was only 3.5% per year in GDP. Between 91 and 96, till Narsimha Rao lasted, those five years, we went from that time there was a crisis, so the growth rate had gone to 1%, from 1% to 8% in just five years. That's the miracle. What did he do? He empowered the people. He removed in one blow all licenses, one blow all the quotas, gave people the right on the market forces basis to import and export. And we reached this level. And the whole world began accepting that India is now becoming a world global power. After that, we, 8% is, we have been achieving it from time to time. But we have not improved on the reforms that Narasimha Rao had brought in. We need to do it now. Your question is, will we be a superpower in economics by 1930? In 10 years, of course we can. But you need some economic reforms. And those economic reforms have not yet been implemented. When you're looking at a plan for action, you have to look at four things. What is your objective? If your goal is superpower in economics by t in 10 years, what's your objective? in terms of economics. Growth rate is an objective. Unemployment removal is an objective. Removal of poverty is another objective. So you can have, you can have uh, any number of uh, objectives, but then you must have priority. And that priority, in my opinion today, is that we must grow at at least 10% per year. So this is the go objective I would put before the government, have target a 10% growth rate. And don't give me all these excuses, nominal growth rate and, uh, and the G GDP correction or uh, estimation, all this is not necessary. By the usual methods adopted by the United Nations, you apply those methods, they are well known, and that, according to that, if the GDP grows for 10% per year for 10 years, India will overtake China and challenge the United States for number one position in the next 50 years. <laughs> according to economists, what is the growth rate? How is it found? It is the rate of investment. What does the rate of investment mean? The total savings in the country of the households, of the corporate sector, of the government sector. Of course, government sectors never save anything. They're always losing. But supposing they can save, it's possible. So these three sectors, savings, plus what is coming from abroad, added together is what is called as total investment. Divide that by the GDP. That, is, that division is called that division is called rate of investment. And the rate of investment, as Hanumanji just now pointed out correctly, 
was at the, had reached the level of 37-38%. And that 37-38% fell and it is now around less than 30, about 29%, little less than 30%. We have to bring it back, back to 37%. And this 37% should be invested efficiently. If there's corruption in the country, it can't be efficient. But how do you, if you um, get, if invest it efficiently? Well, certainly fire fighting corruption is, becomes a very important part of that. But also to see that those who do work, you reward them. So today I will say if I want to go from 29% to 37%, the rate of investment, what will I do? I will abolish income tax first of all because it is the source of all corruption. People ask me, where will the money come for the government? Why does government need money at all? It can print notes. So print notes will be inflationary. Who says that printing notes will be inflationary all the time? Supposing I build a huge highway, eight, eight lanes, four lanes on going, four lanes coming, from Delhi to Madras, and from Calcutta to Bombay. It will employ a very large number of people. So what you do is you print notes. You don't have resources. So you print notes and give it to the workers. The workers will go and spend it. That is demand. Today the problem in the Indian economy is the shortage of demand. People don't have money. People don't have confidence that the money that they are presently got uh, is safe if they spend it or all of it. So therefore, when you put money into the hands of the, uh, of the workers, they will go and uh, spend it and that means the, the demand will come. Those who will be selling it, they will start making profit and then the cycle will start. In 1930, in 1930 the US economy the U.S. economy had a major cash, a crash and it was called the World Depression. And uh, nobody could understand how to rescue the Western countries from this depression. How did this depression come? It came because the U.S. president called all economists of that time, never called more than one economist for advice because if you call more than, if you call 10 economists, they'll give you 15 views and you'll get confused. So just call one person and rely on them. Prime Minister called 40 economists recently and he got 42 opinions. <laughs> so the, he, the President of the United States called 30, uh, a large number of economists and said, my elections are coming. There's so much unemployment in the country. And so I must reduce an unemployment. Please tell me what is the way. So at that stage of knowledge, which is now vastly expanded in economics, that stage of knowledge, the, the, um, the economists said, what you have to do is that the trade unions have raised the wage rates very much. So nobody is employing. So make the labor cheap so that people will start employing companies will start employing. Logically, it seems reasonable. And so he said, uh, they said, you go and talk to the unions and say, till my elections are over, please reduce your wage rate by 10%. And after that, you can raise it again. So the uh, president was impressed. He went and told the trade unions. The trade unions agreed. And the, the wage rates were brought down 10%. What happened then? Suddenly, unemployment started increasing. And the president was baffled. Factories started closing. The depression started arriving. So he uh, 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 called economists not only from America, he called them from England. One of them was John Maynard Keynes. He said, you must understand, economics is not a bilateral negotiation. Economics is a multilateral operation. You do something here, it'll have an effect there. So you reduce the wage rates, therefore the purchasing power of the worker is decreased, 
therefore the workers bought less and therefore their demand fell down and therefore what happened factories started closing if the factories start closing there will be more unemployment this is the basic lesson today between the difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics i tell the prime minister also you are saying ujwala cylinder gas uh, you know um, uh, startups these are all microeconomics what you need is a macroeconomic understanding how to start the engine of the indian economy start moving that is by putting money in the hands of the people so i said first of all abolish income tax and if you abolish income tax the rate of savings will go up the rate of savings go up then along with uh, whatever you are getting from abroad that rate of investment will go up rate of investment means going up means the growth rate will go up that is the way to do it so the objective is 10% growth rate then you have got you can raise your uh, level of of savings to say 35% level of uh, investment to 35% now this 35% convert into rate of growth how you divide it by a, the efficiency factor which in economics we call as the capital output ratio how many rupees of capital you have to invest to generate 1 rupee of of product that capital ra uh, uh, output ratio in india for the last 10 years has been 5 so 35 divided by 5 means 7% growth rate if it is 4 then it will be 7. Point, um, uh, 3%, uh, 4% uh, per growth rate so this is the way to estimate the growth you want a 10% growth rate then 37% investment rate and 3.7 should be your efficiency factor and not 5 as it is today if it is 3.7 then you will get 10% growth rate so how to get that efficiency well um, uh, as i said one of them i have mentioned fight corruption another i mentioned reward people who will invest don't terrorize them with income tax and this gst which is the biggest madness of the 20th first century this gst is so complicated nobody understand which form to fill where and they want it to be uploaded in the computer somebody came from rajasthan barmer he said we don't have electricity how can i upload <laughs> so i said upload it on your head and go to the prime minister and tell him this is the issue so can we go we were already reached once uh, 39% 37% nothing but efficiency in the use of capital that should be your objective and in this there are the question that comes down to is and i'm saying the next step would be the strategy what should be your strategy what is our so called weakness today everybody says agriculture is our weakness agriculture is not your weakness it is your strength but you don't know how to transform it into your strength today the indian farmer produces a output of rice wheat at the lowest rate in the world the productivity of land is poor why is it poor no no guaranteed water oh there is no water well there is plenty of water if uh, i think godavari is 90% going into the ocean it can be put a canal with krishna and then through rayalaseema you can connect to uh, to kaveri if you like there there are there is no shortage of water it is only not being utilized properly but most of all we can desalinate sea water india has a long coastline israel has not a single river in their country yet every tap in israel 24 hours you can get pure water the saudi arabians hate israel but quietly they have bought desalination plant from them they also have 24 hours of water same thing with dubai no river but desalination of sea water 
In our country also where it has been expend, uh, experimented, it has produced results. For example, the atomic energy project Kalpakam in Tamil Nadu, the Tamil Nadu government said we can't give you water for your reactors. So they put a desalination plant. The only place in Tamil Nadu where you get water 24 hours a day, pure water, which you can drink from the tap, water, uh, from the tap itself, is in Kalpakam for their, uh, for their scientists who are living in their colonies. Not anywhere else in Tamil Nadu. Why can't they put uh, about 20 de desalination plant? Oh, it'll cost a lot. What do you mean cost a lot? According to whom? Not uh, according to the atomic energy. Same thing in, uh, in uh, Jamnagar in Gujarat. It's a, it's a bone dry place. When they put up in uh, the Ambani's, uh, Mukesh Ambani put up a, uh, what, a uh, oil refinery, the Jamnagar municipality said, we can't give you water. We don't have water. So he brought in a desalination plant and today the Jamnagar refinery is providing water to the municipality of Jamnagar. <laughs> when I go to Tamil Nadu, these newspaper people ask me because I'm a Tamilian, but I'm also, uh, my parents lived in Karnataka, so I'm a Kannadika. And originally my village is Telugu, by the way, in, uh, because Tirmala Nayaka uh, brought my ancestors. In Ch China too, this is the same position. Large parts of China can't grow agricultural crops because of this reason. So, India, you can grow three crops a year. How many are we growing? How much of it are we are doing? Only 25% of the land has more than one crop. We can grow three crops. And the productivity is so high, potential. Agricultural Research Institute pilot plots show that they, in a, in a controlled experiment, that the yield per acre of food grains is, um, uh, uh, is seven times the yield of the average farmer in India. Imagine our uh, getting seven times more. Milk, we are the largest producer in milk, but we also have 150 million cows. And what is their yield? 200 liters per year. What is the average yield of an Israeli cow? 10,000 liters per year. Now if I got 150 million cows giving you 10,000 liters per year, I'll be coming swimming to Hyderabad. That much in milk will be produced in our country. This is it. Now we come to the second part. Our population is the youngest population in, and therefore it led to, and that involved America exporting uranium to India and therefore Manmohan Singh stopped the research on thorium. And you can use that thorium today. I would say tell the government of India, I in fact told the government of India already and investigations have started, that go for thorium. It will produce pollution-less electricity. It will give you uh, complete uh, control over the way in which you will be able to reach it to the consumers. Similarly, you, we have a problem because we are importing so much crude oil from the Arab countries. Can we find a substitute for that? Of course. It is called hydrogen fuel cells. The Japanese have already solved that problem and their Toyota car is coming out with hydrogen fuel cells as the battery. That means in the night you put a plug it in and in the morning it will be ready for 350 kilometers. And instead of petrol pumps, if you have charging stations, then like every other car it can go. You don't, oil will become obsolete. The Arabs will go back to their tents and their camels after that. <laughs> All this is available and you've got a young population, educate them well. We are hardly spending uh, one and a half percent on, of our GDP on, uh, on education. We should open, instead of uh, 400 universities as they claim, we must have 4,000 universities. This was a land, th this was a land where people used to come to get education, to Nalanda, to so many other places, because we, uh, we specialized in knowledge. And today we discover so many things which the West didn't even know. Today, yoga has become very popular in the West. 
And that's why it also become popular in India. If white man thinks it is good, it must be good for us also. <laughs> Sanskrit is soon going to become a language of the future instead of the language of the past. Why? Artificial intelligence. Research shows, and this is there in the Google, research shows that the best way to store knowledge is through the medium of Sanskrit, because in Sanskrit, there's no confusion about phonetics. If, if, if tomorrow I speak to the computer, if I speak to the computer and I say, put, it will put P-U-T, then I say, but, then it will get confused. Because B-U-T is but, and P-U-T is put. So the computer gets confused. But the Sanskrit, this Devanagari Lippi is so scientific that there can never be any confusion. If you go to Google and type St. James University, uh, James High School or St. John's High School, you will find a news item where the principal of that school is, it's an all-white school, Englishman's school. And that principal has been interviewed and is asked a question, why is it that you force your students from the ages of 6 to 11 to recite Sanskrit shlokas for half an hour every morning? In Britain, huh? and that principal is not an Indian, he's a, a white Englishman. He says, because I have come to the conclusion from my research, research that if young children recite from the ages of 6 to 11 Sanskrit shlokas, for, for uh, half an hour every morning, then their brain development is much faster than anybody else's brain development. So what I'm saying is, your strategy should be to go for innovations. Empower our young people. Make it easy to get education. Tell people that they don't have to pay fees, but when they start earning, they can start returning the money. Not uh, the loan on mortgage or anything like that, which poor people cannot afford. And in our country, many, many poor people have become geniuses. Ramanuja is now considered the biggest genius in mathematics ever, so far, who has been born in this world. And he came from a very poor family. So I, I would say that we don't lack any, uh, we are, our, if our objectives are clear, our priority is first to develop, uh, accelerate our growth rate, then choose our technology in such a way that it generates employment, then to see that the poor get employment, agriculture becomes an exporting country because it produces the cheapest products, our milk is sold at one-sixth the price in Europe, our wheat is sold at one-fourth the price in uh, America. Export our agricultural products. But then you will have to build airports in every district. You will have to f find a way by which this uh, uh, packaging industry, you must set it up in every district so that th these things can be uh, exported. And through the internet, you have to educate the farmer on the internet so he can find out where the prices are the best. All these are within your reach. And if you do that, Within the 10 years, you would become the most developed country in the world. You will be a challenge to the United States because the United States is entirely driven by innovation. And they're now using Indians. They're Microsoft, Indian. And then uh, um, you, you see Google, Indian. Uh, they're surgery, Indian. Uh, Indians everywhere. Even in uh, defrauding, Indians are there. <laughs> So, uh, scientifically defrauding, that is. <laughs> so, I'm saying that we have demonstrated, we have been the developed country of the world for thousands of years. People were coming to our country to find out. For us to become developed again is not a problem. What you need is focus, you need your determination, you need that. I regret to say at the moment, uh, I've not been able to persuade the Prime Minister to think like me. Uh, but uh, I'm sure because he's a very de devoted patriot, uh, when he sees that all the other methods have not worked, I'm sure he will come to the method that I'm <laughs> suggesting. Don't be ever afraid that this government, this country can collapse. We nearly collapsed in, in the 
um, in, in the 1960s uh, uh, when we couldn't produce enough food and we had to beg the Americans. And then Green Revolution came in 10 years. And now we are not importing at all. We don't need to import at all. Then 1990 foreign exchange ex crisis came. Today we have plenty. To, uh, the one place where there's plenty of resources today is the foreign exchange surplus we have. Because at that time, Narsimha Rao brought this economic change. I have found that in 1962, we got a thrashing from the Chinese, and we have now improved uh, our military to such an extent that we can thrash both Pakistan and China at the same time. <laughs> so Indians improve only after a crisis. So please pray for a crisis in the economic field also. <laughs> this country is indestructible. This country has a long history. The UNESCO listed 46 countries, uh, 46 civilizations. The Greek civilization, the Italian, uh, the Roman civilization, the Egyptian civilization, the Mesopotamia, Babylon, all these 46. And what did they find? 45 have disappeared. Only one is still continuing, the Hindu civilization of India. <laughs> India is a continuing civilization. And if people came to this country without the intention to attack us, we have been most hospitable. Look at the uh, Parsis in our country. Does anybody grudge them anything? They are in every place. The Chief Justice was a Parsi, Commandant Chief Manaksha was a Parsi, the Fali uh, Major there was an Air Force Chief, our Attorney General Soli Sarabji. We have Parsis everywhere, but nobody says anything to them. Because they came here in peace, they wanted, uh, they wanted uh, sanctuary, because their country, Iran, was overrun uh, by, by, by the uh, Islamic forces, so they came for, uh, for protection. The Jews, they were persecuted everywhere, brutally. But they came to India, we built them their uh, synagogues in Cochin and in Bombay. And when Israel was formed, many of the Jews went back. But the Israeli parliament passed, after adopting its constitution, passed its first resolution. <clears throat> and it was said what? Thank you, India, the only country where the Jews were not persecuted. <laughs> Our Hindu religion does not deny other religions. It says all religions lead to God. Is there any other religion in the world which says that? By Hindu, I include, of course, Buddhists. If you go to our constitution and read Article 25, it defines Hindu. Hindu is someone who's not a Muslim or a Christian. I didn't define it. It's the founding fathers who defined it. So, because Buddhists say the same thing, of course, in a different format. The Sikhs say the same thing. And the Jains say the same thing. And therefore, we, we consider them as a part of the Hindu because the Hindus also have Sanatana Dharma, we have Arya Samaj, we have so many schools. We don't have one God, we don't have one uh, Masjid or one uh, like Makkah or uh, Vatican. We have numerous temples, temples are coming even in your backyards. So th this country is for heterogeneity in terms of beliefs. We respect it, that's why we have continued as as, uh, as a democracy, and we have continued as democracy not because of our education. In 1977, when Mrs. Gandhi declared the uh, elections, I was that time uh, escaped the second time and gone to America to campaign, and everybody told me at Harvard University, don't go back. Why? why? He says, democracy is for only well-to-do people who are full, stomachs are full, but your country is so much poverty. How can, uh, how can you uh, expect uh, Mrs. Gandhi to lose the election? I said, still, I'll fight the election. So I went back. And when the results come out, I was shocked. The most educated part of India, which is Andhra, undivided, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, all voted for Indira Gandhi and the emergency. And the most uneducated part of India and the poorest part of India 
ಯು ಉತ್ತರ ಪ್ರದೇಶ್ ಮಧ್ಯ ಪ್ರದೇಶ್ ರಾಜಸ್ಥಾನ್ ಬಿಹಾರ್ ಎಕ್ಸೆಟ್ರಾ ದೇ ಆಲ್ ವೋಟೆಡ್ ಅಗೇನ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಕಾಂಗ್ರೆಸ್ ದೇ ಈವನ್ ಡಿಫೀಟೆಡ್ ಇಂದಿರಾ ಗಾಂಧಿ ಇನ್ ಯು ಪಿ ಹೌ ಡು ಯು ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಡೋಂಟ್ ಅಲೌ ವೆಸ್ಟರ್ನ್ ಎಜುಕೇಶನ್ ಟು ಡಾಮಿನೇಟ್ ಯುವರ್ ಥಿಂಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ವಾರ್ ಆರ್ ಏನ್ಷಿಯಂಟ್ ಸಿವಿಲೈಸೇಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ಟಾಟಸ್ ಯು ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಅ ಡೆಮೊಕ್ರಾಟ್ ಆಲ್ ರಿಲಿಜನ್ಸ್ ಲೀಡ್ ಟು ಗಾಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ದ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಡೆಮೊಕ್ರಾಟಿಕ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸೇ ಸೊ ದೇ ಫೋರ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ದಟ್ ಫೇತ್ ದಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕಂಟ್ರಿ ಇಸ್ ಇನ್ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಟಬಲ್ ಬಟ್ ಇನ್ ಆರ್ಡರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಅಸ್ ಟು ಬಿಕಮ್ ಡೆವಲಪ್ ಕಂಟ್ರಿ ನೋ ಆರ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರೆಂಥ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅಪ್ಲೈ ಯೋರ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ಹೋಲಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ವೇ ನಾಟ್ ಇನ್ ಟರ್ಮ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಒನ್ ಸೆಕ್ಟರ್ ಅನದರ್ ಸೆಕ್ಟರ್ ಬಟ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ಹೋಲಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ವೇ ದಿಸ್ ಕಂಟ್ರಿ ವಿಲ್ ಡೆಫಿನೆಟ್ಲಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಬಿಲೀವ್ ದಟ್ ಸ್ಟೇಜ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾವ್ ಕಮ್ when after seeing the last one year of economic crisis the mind has been made up we have to do something radical i am 100% certain that by 2030 we will be the most developed country in the world challenging the united states thank you very much